from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by the following. AARP West Virginia, your ally for real possibilities in the Mountain State. Online at aarp.org slash wv. West Virginia University. Online at wvu.edu. At the legislature today, an update on budget negotiations from Governor Jim Justice, who says his talks with Republican House leaders have ended, at least for now. In the House, members debate amendments to a bill that would end the Greyhound Breeding Fund, and senators vote to override the governor's first veto. Those stories and more coming up on the legislature today. Good evening, I'm Ashton Mara. Governor Jim Justice says budget negotiations have broken down between Democrats and House leadership after talks this week. Justice says they were near a deal when House Republicans refused to put about $45 million in tax increases to a vote in the chamber. Governor Jim Justice held a press conference this morning to update the public on how budget negotiations are going. Surrounded by Democrats from both chambers, Justice says while his office is still willing to negotiate a budget deal with Republican leaders in the House, they reached an impasse Wednesday night. We've had all kinds of discussions and we got right to the altar. I mean, right to the altar. And we basically, and, and, and you know, I. I'm surely not going to cast stones in any way, but the net net of the whole thing was we got right to the altar and we couldn't make a decision. That decision, Justice says, is to raise taxes by $45 million in one of two ways, either by increasing the consumer sales tax by a quarter of a cent or one penny on every $4 West Virginians spend, or by increasing the cigarette tax by 15 cents and the tax on sugary drinks by two cents. But those were two options Republican leaders didn't want to choose from, according to the governor. We can throw the baby out with the dishwater and, and end up starting all over, and it would be catastrophic to our state and to all of us. And, uh, and so we were right at the altar. We couldn't get a vote. And we couldn't get a decision. It surely didn't come from the Dems, but the Republicans couldn't decide what to do. And then they left. And that was last night. Justice says there were a number of things his office and House Republican leaders could agree to, though. He says both sides agreed to keep the 2% pay raise for teachers in the budget, which would cost the state about $20 million a year. They also agreed to keep in place the 2% across the board cuts former Governor Earl Ray Tomlin implemented in November, and to some additional small cuts to the Division of Corrections, Department of Education and the Arts, and Department of Health and Human Resources, among others. I don't want to cut any more than, than we've already proposed in the beginning, but you can take a little bit of this out and it not hurt badly. The 2 percent across the board, if I, if I had my way, I wouldn't go along with it, but you've got to understand everybody said over and over, you know, justice won't compromise on stuff. Well, justice is tr sitting here telling you we have to compromise on things to get to where we want to get to. Justice says he wants that additional $45 million in taxes, but his two options, the increased sales tax or sin taxes, those aren't the only choices. I'm not going to say, well, it has to be this way or I'm going to veto it. All I'm going to say is it has to be, the philosophy has to be, you cannot paralyze our state and cut things that are imperative to our state and me not veto it. And we've got to find a pathway out of this that gives us hope and prosperity to get rid of the drugs, to change education, to do the right things without hurting our people and constricting more. 
It's as simple as that. Justice was asked about votes taken in both chambers earlier this week to kill the tax increases he initially proposed in his budget plan. People are just trying to, you know, make their point, grandstand, whatever it may be, you know, but ultimately, at the end of the day, we're getting, well, we got, we got awfully, awfully, awfully close. And, and, I, and I hope to goodness that uh, cool heads, I've said it many times, there's no need in either side standing and beating your chest. Now is when cool heads need to think, be smart, have wisdom, work together, and finish this up. Justice says he does not see a need to extend the regular session to work on the budget, and he wants to come to some kind of agreement with Republican leaders. The final day of the 60-day legislative session is Saturday, April 8th. Senators have voted to override Governor Justice's veto of Senate Bill 330. The bill was an attempt to clarify some language in the state's right to work law, which was approved by lawmakers in the 2016 session. After its passage, the law was challenged in court and was recently ruled unconstitutional by a Kanawha County judge. Justice noted in his veto message that lawmakers should wait for a final decision from the West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals, which is expected by late April. On the floor today, though, Senate Judiciary Chair Charles Trump argued in favor of the override. This does not interfere in any way with the adjudication of the question of whether or not there's constitutional authority for the legislation or whether the legislation is somehow inconsistent with the United States Constitution or the West Virginia Constitution, which clearly, in my opinion, it is not. I'll say that again. Uh, but it only our action in the, in the bill that we uh, passed, Senate Bill 330, was just to take out the part of the statute that the court found to be vague or ambiguous. It takes only a simple majority vote to override a, gu a gubernatorial veto. Senators voted 21 to 12 today to do so. It will also take a vote in the House of Delegates for the bill to become law without the governor's signature. A bill to eliminate the West Virginia Greyhound Breeding Development Fund is making its way through the House. It's been on second reading, or the amendment phase, since Tuesday. But due to a laundry list of amendments and some heated debate, consideration was postponed until today. Liz McCormick reports. Senate Bill 437 eliminates the Greyhound Breeding and Development Fund, putting some $14 million back into the state's excess lottery revenue fund to be used for appropriations by the legislature. The fund is made up of a percentage of the money from table games at the state's two Greyhound racetrack casinos in Wheeling and Nitro. The appropriations help pay for dog breeding as well as bet winnings. The House considered one amendment to the bill today. The amendment came from Delegate Jeff Eldridge, a Democrat from Lincoln County. Rather than getting rid of the fund altogether, his amendment would instead look to another funding source to help support the state's budget crisis, horse racing. His amendment would take half of the monies from the Greyhound Breeding Fund and the other half from a similar fund set up for the horse racing industry. Eldridge says by doing this, it'll keep the Greyhound industry alive in the state and save some of his constituents' jobs. There's some discrepancy of how many jobs this is. Well, if it's one job in my district, I'm going to stand up and fight for it. And if I could offer 50 more bad amendments to this thing, I would. Everybody gets up here and stands for their district and what they stand for. If we can't band together as a group of people to fight for your district, then we're here for the wrong reasons. Officials from the Greyhound Racing Industry estimate eliminating the fund would cost nearly 1,700 jobs in West Virginia. House Finance Chair Delegate Eric Nelson says he understands the concerns from Eldridge, but he says the industry is dwindling and the state needs the money. He spoke against the amendment. 20 years ago, the racing industry for our greyhounds and really thoroughbreds was thriving much greater than it is now. But over these last 10 years especially, there's been a tremendous decline. You know, I think I stated the other day that just in Wheeling alone, how the participation at the track as far as people attending has gone from 900,000 20 years ago down to less than 20 last year, or maybe it was 2013 according to a study. 
Democrat Sean Fluharty of Ohio County spoke in favor of the amendment, saying the industry brings in dollars that help the state. He pointed to a recent record from the racetrack in Wheeling. Ladies and gentlemen, I have with me, this, this stuff is public record, easy print out. It's imagine what you can do when you spend five minutes on the internet. Charts for Friday afternoon, March 24th, 2017 at the Wheeling Downs. This is just a Friday afternoon at the Wheeling Downs. Total handle, I've highlighted, $220,436.26. $220,000 on one Friday afternoon, of which 1% every day goes back to the state. House Majority Leader Darrell Coles of Morgan County opposed the amendment. He brought up a recent bill that died in the chamber, one that would have eliminated the film tax credit and raised the beer barrel tax, and said there's not much else the body can do except look to cuts. Eliminating the film tax credit, that would save us $5 million perhaps, but that's not on the list, I guess, or, or transferring money, or a beer tax, or a... Uh, tax reform, none of those things are, if those aren't the other things that we might consider, I think this is what we're left with. And undergirding all that is the fact that I believe the general public just no longer supports the raising and training and running of dogs for bed and money. Delegate Eldridge's amendment failed on a roll call vote of 39 to 57. Senate Bill 437 will be on third reading and up for a final vote in the chamber tomorrow. For the legislature today, I'm Liz McCormick in the House. Employees would have to authorize deductions from their paychecks every year under a Senate bill under consideration in the House. Senate Bill 239 would require employees to sign off on payroll deductions each year, deductions that may pay for their union or professional organization dues. The bill was the subject of a public hearing this morning. Ten people spoke against the bill, two in favor. Here's a look at that public hearing sponsored by the House Judiciary Committee. The question that remains to be answered as this bill is moved through the legislative process is why is this bill needed? What is the purpose of this bill? No one has an answer. Senate Bill 239 appears to be a bill that is in search of a problem. Now, to my knowledge, there have been no complaints from businesses, employees, or employers regarding the current method for which dues, credit union accounts, charities, etc., are deducted from the employee's pay. Currently, some employers are able to deduct wages from a worker's paycheck for political purposes without first seeking that worker's consent. This practice is absolutely unacceptable because it undermines West Virginia's free speech and it takes money away from their paychecks and their families that they could use otherwise as they see fit. I stand here today to say that the West Virginia Troopers Association is opposed to Senate Bill 239. The reason being is because not only will the first year that we have to go back and have every trooper across the state and all of our counties sign another form so that their dues will be deducted, we will lose members. And we will lose members every year after that by trying to have to have them re-sign every year. Basically, it will kill my organization if this bill passes. This proposal is not a complicated one, and despite what you hear about this, uh, interfering or violating certain individuals' rights or targeting certain groups, this law actually empowers our workforce. It gives them clarity and it gives them the power to make decisions regarding where their hard-earned dollars go with regards to certain deductions and their paychecks. And it's really that simple. Senate Bill 239 passed out of the House Judiciary Committee this afternoon. Senators are not giving up their position on a bill that expands the powers of the State Department of Highways in some contracting areas. The chamber worked its version of the bill to remove caps on design build projects in two committees and through an amendment on the floor today is pressuring the House to join them. House Bill 2722 is similar to Senate Bill 417, which was seen by the Senate's Transportation and Finance Committees. The Senate's version of the bill removed the dollar caps on projects undertaken by the Division of Highways using the design-build method. 
Design Build is a tool used in government to accelerate the building of roads and bridges. In West Virginia, it allows the DOH to bid the design and construction aspects of a certain project in one contract. The practice began as a pilot project and limited the DOH to spending $50 million on any one project and $100 million in one year using the method. Senators decided to remove that cap after hearing from new Transportation Secretary Tom Smith. Smith calls Design Build the standard standard for the nation and expanding the program, he says, will save the state money on major construction projects. The House, however, chose to only increase the limits, allowing the DOH to spend $100 million per project and $300 million in the program each year. Senate Transportation Chair Greg Boso amended the Senate's version of the bill without the caps into the House bill on the floor today. We have a number of projects throughout the state that uh, will with these particular caps will limit our ability to accomplish these projects. The Department of Highways needs the flexibility to be able to accomplish, for instance, the Wheeling Bridge and Tunnel Renovation Project, which is a $130 million capital improvement project, or ex correction, it's not a capital improvement project, it is actually a renovation and, and um, elimination of some hazards that are there on that particular corridor. It's vital for us to be able to invest but the design build tool, more than anything else, is a flexible tool that the Department of Highways can utilize to respond very quickly when times of disaster occur. On a voice vote, senators accepted the amendment and the bill will be put to a final vote in the chamber tomorrow. There are some family names that just stick out in the world of West Virginia politics. The Rockefellers, the Mansions, and of course the Capitos. U.S. Senator Shelley Moore Capito is the daughter of former Governor Arch Moore, who passed away last year. Now her son is continuing the family legacy in politics as a member of the West Virginia House of Delegates. My full birth name is Arch Alfred Moore Capito. As you can imagine, the first three of those names belong to my grandfather. You know, on all of the official documents, I was Arch, so when the teacher or the person asking if Arch was here spoke up, they typically wouldn't hear something until somebody jabbed me and said, Moore, Moore, that's you. But I've always gone by Moore, and uh, that, of course, is my third name. Having four names uh, makes monogramming very difficult, I suppose. And it also makes filling out any tax identification, driver's license, and things like that very difficult. But it's special because when I see it, I always think of my grandfather, and it's very special to me. This desk uh, was my grandfather's desk, and then after that was my mother's desk. Um, every desk, uh, every desk in this chamber has a story to tell, and it is an extreme honor to sit at any one of them. For me personally, I look up and see as mentors my, you know, my mother and my grandfather and see that the, the positive impact that they've had on West Virginia. And so to follow that and to sit in this chair, I will say it's, uh, it's pretty humbling to be part of that story and to be part of the story maybe that this desk will share someday. When mom ran for the first time in 96, we kind of got to do some sign waving and putting some yard signs in and, and passing out some literature. I thought it was the coolest thing that she was doing this, and, and so did my dad, and obviously that was important. She had a great mentor in her father, and he's obviously instilled great uh, lessons in her. And I have the most fond memories of my grandfather. He was so involved in our lives and had such a positive impact on me and my whole family. What he really instilled in me, and I'll never forget this, is the one thing that, that kind of stuck with me when I was entering into my uh, post-college years. He had written me a letter and said that he had found throughout his life that successful people are oftentimes good listeners. And he suggested that I adopt that creed. And so I've tried in my professional and personal life to be a good listener and to hear what people have to say. I've always been interested in public service. It's always been a part of my life. Now to get directly involved with it uh, was something that just came to me more recently. I have a 22 month old at home. I've been married for just under five years now. And when you start to grow a family in a place that you grow up and that you love very much, 
you start to think about what you want that place to look like for your children. And so I hope that when she grows up, she'll know what her grandmother has done and what her great grandfather did. And perhaps what I'm able to do is all positive and is because we wanted to make a, a change and ultimately to strengthen West Virginia. And so to sit down at this desk, I would say was a special experience. Knowing who had been here before me was certainly important to me, given the relationship that I've had with two very important people in my life that have occupied the same seat. So when I look down and I see some of the markings on the desk, it kind of reminds me to be on my best behavior. You know, sons always want to make their mother proud. And to the extent that I can do that, that would be certainly something I'd be very proud of. During the 2015 legislative session, lawmakers approved a plan to reintroduce elk into the state. It took almost two years for that plan to come to fruition, but in December, former Governor Earl Ray Tomlin celebrated the release of a small population into southern West Virginia. We revisit this story where Clark Davis reports the release was just the first step in a plan the former governor and lawmakers alike hope will bolster economic diversification in the region. You, uh, you don't ne necessarily think of elk as something that draws a big crowd, but, you know, it's a historic day. With that, West Virginia's 35th governor, O. Ray Tomlin, reintroduced a population of elk in the state after more than 140 years. The 24 elk were released on top of a reclaimed mine site on the border of Logan and Mingo counties. This is just the first of several carefully planned releases designed to establish self-sustaining and viable populations in the Mountain State. In 2015, legislation authorized the Division of Natural Resources to begin an active elk restoration plan, starting with finding enough suitable land to sustain a population. Through a partnership with the Conservation Fund, the agency acquired more than 32,000 acres of publicly accessible land and another 10,000 through lease agreements. The elk were sourced from a national recreation area in western Kentucky and brought to the Tomlin Wildlife Management Area. Initially fenced in, DNR officers gave the elk some time to settle before they were released and able to roam the acreage freely. To think we're going to have elk running these hills and hollows is something really special for all of us, whether you're a hunter or somebody just loves these majestic creatures. Congressman Evan Jenkins attended the December ceremony marking the release. He, like the other politicians in attendance, believes the new population will do more than just enhance the state's natural beauty. And I think, yeah, having this uh, elk uh, herd back in West Virginia is something positive for southern West Virginia. It'll bring uh, tourists in, hopefully cause a little bit of an uptick in our economy in southern West Virginia. Tomlin says the reintroduction of the species will help diversify the economy of the region. In nearby Kentucky, they began reintroducing the animals in the late 90s. And since, the population has grown exponentially with more than 10,000 elk living in a 15-county area in eastern Kentucky. In those areas, wildlife tours are provided and restaurants and shops have popped up to support the industry. And then there's the potential for hunting. In Kentucky, hunters enter a lottery for permits to pursue the prized animals. DNR Director Bob Falla estimates it could be 10 years before West Virginia's herd is large enough to allow for hunting, but it's still part of the reintroduction plan. State wildlife officials spent an estimated 250000 on the effort, most of which came from the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, a Montana-based conservation group dedicated to helping grow the species. The DNR will buy more than 40,000 acres being used for the program in phases, using money from state taxes on hunting equipment, as well as grant money. The state has received a $250,000 grant from the Walmart Acres for America program, and a $250,000 grant from the Knobloch Family Foundation. Still, Fallis says the elk restoration program is the taxpayers. This is your day. Every time you buy a hunting or a fishing license or a stamp or a, a box of shelves, you pay for all this. So this is, this, is, this is your day, and you've made it all possible. The DNR hopes that as the female elk give birth to calves, the population will expand and eventually take hold in Logan, McDowell, Mingo, Wyoming, Boone, Lincoln, and Wayne counties. The progress of the herd and their migration throughout the state 
and potentially into neighbor states will be tracked through electronic animal tags already placed on the animals. West Virginia's elk restoration program is part of a larger project happening in Kentucky, but also Virginia, helping the species grow in the Appalachian region. For the Legislature Today, I'm Clark Davis in Logan County. Tomorrow morning on the West Virginia Channel, we'll be bringing you live coverage of the final days of this legislative session. Tune in at 11 a.m. to watch the House and Senate floor sessions, where lawmakers have just over a week left to consider legislation. And the House Judiciary Committee will be holding a public hearing tomorrow on Senate Bill 212. The bill would take the power to revoke licenses after a DUI from the Division of Motor Vehicles and give it to a judge. That public hearing will also be broadcast on the West Virginia Channel following tomorrow's floor sessions. This has been the Legislature Today. I'm Ashton Mara. Thanks for joining us. Support for the legislature today is provided by the following. AARP West Virginia, your ally for real possibilities in the Mountain State. Online at aarp.org slash WV. West Virginia University. Online at wvu.edu. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting.